ইউটিউবে বলে আসবে আজকে যখন আসবে তখন হ্যালো গুড মর্নিং সো দিস ইজ দ্য ফার্স্ট লিপসেশন ফর দ্য ক্লোথস আয়রন মেকিং অ্যান্ড স্টিল মেকিং and uh, we have got uh, some queries uh, from your what is the that is uh, on the discussion forum and some queries very few queries on the the google sheet that was shared with you so basically most of the questions are on the discussion forum and uh, we will discuss uh, on the discussion forum okay fine so the basic question that was asked that numericals are basically you ask that is some of you say that numericals are quite tough and um, and those uh, <coughs> uh, one minute just vibhangshu uh, it is coming actually vibhangshu uh, are you hearing me actually when i am talking after 10 minutes it is coming when i stop and then because when i am telling something okay yeah yeah, uh, yeah. then it is not hard but uh, then my voice is coming diverting back okay? sir your uh, actually sir you uh, please mute your youtube sir 10 seconds sir please you, uh, mute your youtube so hmm. okay so uh, you can uh, start now sir no no i no 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 bibang shu first time to talk okay, to no, you no, because no. i need to understand okay. one minute just Uh, mute my YouTube one minute, one minute, just, yeah, what is that? Yeah, the problem is, this is, this is not very good actually. When I am talking, it is not going directly. After 10 seconds, my voice is reverting, but I have to stop that time. And then when it is stopping, suddenly I stop somewhere. It is not, sentence is not complete. Then I have to again disturb like that. Mm. it is not your system you have not done a very good so you should have done completely in either in webex or something like that you see this <laughs> this is i don't know how to speak with them actually so what i'll do that is suppose i am telling some sentences okay yes. then suddenly the, my voice is coming from the youtube is going that time okay then i have to stop when i am speaking in the youtube no, no? Sir, have... you, you do not watch the youtube video only you <coughs> you uh, uh um, delivered the lecture on uh, cisco java no, no. sir very, very good you but you to what no no then how do i how can't i listen it then i have to mute it okay that thing oh yes 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 sir Because... you can you always uh? mute the youtube sir Oh, achha. I always mute the YouTube. No, fine, fine. Yeah, yes, okay. yes, 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 sir. You always uh, you, uh, mute the YouTube only. Uh, you should uh, watch the only query. 
okay fine fine not fine. the okay. video sir okay 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 so so i am just now the, the that is the fine that is the problem so i should start now okay i should start now again okay so you to where it is now you i am finding you you should go and then i will start na i will start again yeah yeah sir now you connected to youtube lucky okay, i don't know what to do now yeah yes yeah, sir i uh, i am also connected na na now i start suddenly or when do i start yeah, yeah, yeah sir no 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 sir you can start now start now but i cannot see my video now so your your thing is coming in front of me so okay fine uh it is it is the i think it is like uh, this thing yeah yeah fine fine now it is okay so should i start now nee. okay good morning uh, there was some abar again apnar jinish ta chole gelo yeah good morning um uh, uh, there was some technical uh, snag actually that's why there is some problem so okay good morning to everybody uh, uh we got some question as i said that is from the forum as well as from the google sheet that was shared with you but in the google sheet uh, your uh, questions were very few only three and in forum there are some questions were there but not that much but anyway i will discuss all this all of your queries and first of all you say that the numericals was uh, quite tough okay and uh, <coughs> but and also you say there is the lecture and the numerical do not actually correspond sometimes i am not teaching something in the uh, lecture but it is coming in the numericals okay so but the problem is that you can see there is the numericals are very based on basically very elementary arithmetic algebra geometry stoichiometry heat and material balance and some basic uh uh your uh, laws like stokes law sain's law and some of the laws that will be taught in my class okay so numericals you have to do applying your basic elementary mathematics okay and uh, it will the concept will be there actually in my lecture all the concept will be there and you will find that my lecture and the numericals will be corresponds also except the numerical one where basically the problems were completely based on simple arithmetic algebra and geometry and maybe some stoichiometry and some simple thermodynamics okay so very basic thermodynamics that i assume that you know and i will just i talk about that thing and uh, so 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 this was the thing so that was the starting uh, <coughs> numericals numerical 1 and i thought that you should have done it but anyway all the numerical solution will will be provided with you after you submit your assignment and then the numerical solution will be provided and then you can see uh, how to do all this problem those things will be there and uh, <coughs> and later on you will find all the numerical that i did that will definitely follow the rules okay some laws i will discuss and then it will come but you do not think that is the i am not teaching that is the how to solve the, those problem one by one not like that it is not a tutorial class like that but anyway you have a discussion forum if you can put some problem you are facing but you have to apply your brain you have to apply your simple uh, mathematics and and all the problems will be related to the arithmetic mistake and still if you have problem you can forum is there you can ask question my student binoy kumar is there he is the student he has answered some of your question and if you uh, post some questions binoy will try to answer it binoy cannot binoy will uh, want my intervention i can intervene and then i can also answer your queries so okay. so that will not be a problem okay so this is first thing i would like to clarify and somebody says that they are preparing for gate but actually you see this course is not only for preparing for gate obviously it is it will be helpful for preparing for gate uh, it will my course if you follow correctly it will clear your doubts okay and you clear your concept on the uh, i will making and still okay and also lot of difficult subjects you will take to know and i will discuss i think the 
to three new companies in Pakistan and plus. But anyway, but as I said, that each new vehicle we are not going to be separate into you. You can, if you understand that class, then you can accept uh, uh, that is the numerical one. Okay, so in numerical one, uh, for example, that is the numerical one we have given, it's the first problem if you see. That was for simple geometry. We have a simple geometrical idea, then you can calculate the volumes or different sections of the blast furnace with and without refectory. Then you can calculate the volume of the refectory. You can calculate how much refectory is required and all this thing. And why you have given this problem? Because when you solve this problem, then you have an idea about the dimension, media dimensions of the um, blast furnace, what is the internal volume, and with refectory, what is the internal volume? Without refractory and what is the mass of refractory involved in the blast furnace? Typical values and what is the typical cost of the refractory? So these are very uh, essential ideas. And if you do the numericals, then these ideas will be uh, framed into your mind and you will never forget. Okay. And the rest of the numericals were basically from your. Uh, <coughs> uh, Thermodynamics, basic thermodynamics, right? Because at equilibrium, you can calculate the composition of any reaction. Any reaction is going on because the, at equilibrium, you can calculate the composition of the gas and composition of the reactant and product and the reactant and the product everything using the simple formula that is the delta G naught is equal to RT of K minus RT of K. The delta G naught is the standard free energy change, and K is the equilibrium constant. Okay, so and K is basically the ratio of activity ratio of the product. That is the activity of product, and divided by the product of activities of the reactant. Okay, so that is called the equilibrium constant, and from there you can get any composition. And uh, since it is the standard free energy change, you can find uh, that. <coughs> okay, let me see that if I can share some uh, whiteboard and then tell you uh, it will be better. Okay, just let me let me share the whiteboard. Yes. I'm sure the world is too much. I don't know. Yes. Sure. It's perfect. Yes, sir. What can you share for us? You want to take a picture? Desktop is screen one, nothing. Sir, you, uh, your uh, what file is uh, already open or not? No, no, already open now. Open cool now, sir. But you want desktop to cool now. What number take a desktop? Screen one, sir. Yes, sir. Desktop, desktop. Screen one, screen two, one, two, three, four. I think it's three or five. Hello? 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 Hello?
ভালো সিস্টেম এখানে আমি যদি যাই আপনি দেখতে পান নাকি দেখুন হ্যাঁ <laughs> So then you can write the standard energy change for this reaction as activity of FE, partial pressure of FE by activity of FE. So from basic thermodynamics, you know, like this, that is the activity of the gas is represented in terms of partial pressure and activity of solid are given like this. And since the pure solid, this is the reaction we are considering. Uh, standard free energy change, so iron and iron oxide are in their standard state, that is the pure state. So their activity, you can take it as one, okay? So then it is basically PCO2 by PCO. Now, you can calculate this delta genot value from the data that are given using the base law of constant heat summation. That is the base law you can apply. Because these equations are given in, uh, uh, <clears throat> I think, we know you have answered, I think, that is this. So you have to calculate the delta G0 for this reaction, and then you can calculate the PCO delta C like this. So uh, these are basically standard uh, thermodynamics for where you can calculate this thing. Okay. Fine. So this is the way you can calculate. And um, <clears throat> Let's see now the another question. The first question, let's go to the Samrat. Ask the question, how clear gas volume is calculated? Okay. So let us go to the, again, uh, if we want to tell you, that is the, how the clear gas volume is. Uh, let's start there. Uh, share again. Yeah. Okay. So, come to the new page. So how the clear gas volume is calculated? Basically, when you calculate the clear gas volume, basically plus C plus carbon, you have to burn the carbon to form the CO gas, right? This is the thing. That is when you are calculating the blast volume, that is the clear gas volume, anything for the blast volume, you have to use uh, simple stoichiometry, right? So, suppose you are burning 1 kg of carbon, right? So, 1 kg of carbon you are burning, how much oxygen that you need? So, 1 kg of carbon means 1 by 12 kg mole of carbon, right? You are burning 1 kg mole of carbon. So, how much oxygen is required? Oxygen required is around you know, this thing, that is the half of half kg mole of oxygen required, or one kg atom of oxygen, you can see. That requires one kg atom of oxygen. Right. And that will produce basically one kg mole of CO. Right. So, and then it will also contain some nitrogen. And this is also, uh, you have nitrogen on the left hand side, so it will remain unaffected because it is not participated in the research, plus nitrogen. So nitrogen, how much mole of nitrogen will be there? Nitrogen will be, you know, so this is your nitrogen. Nitrogen will be your 79 by 21 of kg mole of oxygen, right? or you can say into half, half kg mole of oxygen, so like this. One kg atom of oxygen, or it is equivalent to your basically half kg mole of oxygen. So this is the definition. So what will be the, so if you burn just one kg of carbon, so what will be the clear gas volume? 
we are just going to need V. So if you burn for a part per per kg of carbon burn, the clear gas volume, how much would be the clear gas volume? So it is one by one by twelve. So if it is one by twelve, so you can say one by twelve into two, right? Basically, one by twelve here it is here. It is two into twelve kg mole if you like, right? So this much of so if you want to burn one kg of carbon or one by twelve kg mole of carbon, you require oxygen. 1 by 24 kg mole of oxygen. Okay, so this much of oxygen will produce actually two times of this, two times of CO, that is the carbon in carbon monoxide in two moles, and twice of oxygen. So twice plus nitrogen will be 3.79 by 21, if you say. So 21. So this much of kg mole. And if you multiply it by 22.4, that will give you normal meter. So this is the way, and it will come 5.37. In stands for normal meter cube. Okay. So this is the way you can calculate from simple stoichiometry. It is basically the simple stoichiometry. If you apply, it, you can calculate this thing. Okay. Fine. So this is the way. Now, <coughs> next question was from Dastur. Pankaj, uh, while solving the problem related to oxygen enrichment, the unit of blast volume in normal meter cube per kg of carbon, this kg of carbon burn carbon at the tier or the total carbon? Now, this is actually the carbon burn at the tier. That is the thing. It is not the total carbon. Basically, what you charge the carbon in the blast furnace uh, majority of it participate in the reaction by burning at the clear, but your uh, a part of it goes into the hot metal, and that remains inactive. Usually, the hot metal power contains around say four to five percent of carbon, uh, so it will constitute around ten percent of. Coke that is charged, coke, that is the total carbon rate in the blast fund is say 500 kg. So around uh, 50 kg goes into the hot metal. So that means um, out of 500, 50 kg of carbon will go into the hot metal. So around 10% of the coke that is charged, 10% the, the, the of the carbon, total carbon, it, including the coke plus the PCI, pulverized coal injection. So total carbon charge, if it is 500 kg, out of which 50 kg will go into the hot metal as inactive carbon. So around 10% of the total carbon charge in the blast furnace will remain inactive. And 90% will participate into the two reaction. It bonds at the two Okay. So you must be clear about that thing. So when you are solving anything, boxing in any problem, so what is the amount of the carbon bond is around 90% of that thing. Okay, so that you can do by carbon balance also. That is the thing. So in the what the question was, what is that carbon? Carbon is basically the carbon that bonds on the tier. Okay, Shamra asks, uh, then then Shamra does isothermal zone increase with the oxygen enrichment? Isothermal zone increase with the oxygen enrichment. Yes. Um, if you do the oxygen enrichment, what happens? your blast volume decreases. Why blast volume decreases? Because you are enriched the air blast by oxygen. Okay, and to burn a certain amount of carbon, you are burning a fixed amount of carbon, but you are increasing the oxygen in the air blast. Obviously, your oxygen, there is the air blast amount will decrease to burn the same amount of carbon. Okay, so blast volume decreases. As the blast volume decreases, to your gas volume will decrease because the nitrogen is less than. Okay, so your blast air gas volume is also decreased. So total gas that is produced in the blast furnace that decreases. So the lower part, so that is called the heat capacity of the blast furnace gas decreases to some extent, you can say, <clears throat> because the volume is decreasing. But then you can ask how the 
um, heat balance is better. Because if you do the oxygen enrichment, then the blast temperature, that is the adiabatic flame temperature or the flame temperature also increases because the blast flow decreases. At the same time, you are burning the same amount of the carbon. That is your heat generation remains constant, but the pure gas volume decreases. That basically would increase the adiabatic flame temperature, right? So if you increase the flame temperature, then the potential of the gas also increases. So that's why, basically, if you see, uh, just I can show you, that is how it is meter uh, energy balance. One minute, just uh, you can share again. Okay, uh, so it can be shown very nice. I have shown you, I think, from here. That is, if you draw the heat capacity, yeah, in the oxygen enrichment, you know this diagram. Basically, typically, if you draw the heat capacity versus temperature, here the temperature and your heat capacity. Like this. So this is the solid heat capacity, okay? And typical, suppose this is your gas. Okay, so this is the gas heat capacity. And after oxygen enrichment, what happened? The gas volume decreases, adiabatic flame temperature increases. So it is going like this, suppose here. This is the heat capacity of the gas with oxygen enrichment. So you can see the heat capacity has decreased. Like this. So <clears throat> you can find with the, this is with the gas with oxygen enrichment. Right. So lower part heat balance, you can know this is the energy that you have to supply. If you can see, if you can write it like this, so A, B, C, D. So A, B, C, D basically represent lower part Heat requirement by solid. This is the world word part heat requirement by the solid, that is the A, B, C, D, right? And uh, uh, <coughs> this is the lower part heat requirement by the solid. And gas, gas heat requirement is given by like this, if you see that, let's see. Mm -hmm. Like this. Yeah. So, so heat supply by the gas will be given by without oxygen enrichment. You will, I am writing it like this. Yeah, you like J. Okay. This is not J. So, like this. So, G, J, this is the G, J, and then you can put it something. K, then K, A. So, this G, J, K, A, this is the heat supplied by the gas. By the gas, and these two areas should be equal at the lower part heat balance. You can see that in blast is upper part, lower part, CD should be equal to G, J, K. So these two items should be same. Okay. And uh, <coughs> similarly, your with oxy without oxygen and without. And this is the area, basically, H, I, E, A. This is also heat supplied by 
supplied by the gas with oxygen enrichment. And also in this case also, we have ABCD, ABCD is equal to HIEA with oxygen and disconnect. Right, so this thing. So you can find that your temperature, flame temperature has increased, heat capacity of the gas decreased, but you can still to maintain the heat balance in the lower part of the furnace. So if you do this thing, then when you are doing this thing, okay, I can now stop sharing. Yeah. So that is the thing that, uh, uh, So this is the way of oxygen enrichment. What happens is that your flame temperature increases, but the heat capacity of the gas decreases. This is the volume of the gas decreases. But you can still maintain the heat balance in the lower part of the furnace. But since the total volume of the gas is less, the heat exchange will require less volume of the blast furnace. Volume, less blast furnace volume will be required to make that heat exchange. Okay. So that's why your isothermal zone obviously will shift down. Isothermal zone will shift down. And uh, that's why the isothermal zone will increase uh, if you do the oxygen enrichment. Okay, isothermal zone will definitely increase because you are requiring the lower part of the furnace, you require less volume to maintain the heat balance. Um, and also, somebody asked me why raft increases. You can definitely uh, understand why the raft increases. Okay. Then another question was there. Uh, Acha, let me see in the forum some question has come and now there is time. Okay. Mm. Everyone should uh, want to go there and see whether some chat has come or not. Yes, sir. Huh? Uh, Hello, sir. Yes, yes. Where is that? Leave the. This is coming up. Why it is coming up? Why still it is there? Yes, sir. Where is there? And. Uh, Sir, you want to open the uh, Google feed or uh, YouTube? YouTube, YouTube. What is the YouTube? Any question YouTube is there? already sir, opened uh, in your browser. Yeah. Leave session I've been making, but I want to see the question if they have it. I'm not seeing the YouTube thing. So yes, it is the YouTube. only one question is there. Oh, there only something. one question. Huh. The sir, uh, time assignment. Uh, Some hello, messages. Sir. Yes, yes. Yes, session delivery. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Sir, studio is better than studio. Sir, I'm going to go to the studio. 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 I'm going to
আমি অন্যটাই যাই কি করে স্যার স্যার এ স্যার ইউ ক্যান ইউ ক্যান ওপেন অলসো দা চ্যাট বক্স ইন ইওর সিসকো মিটিংস এন্ড আই আম পুটিং দা কোশ্চেন হিয়ার টপ চ্যাট বক্সে তো কিছু নেই লিস আমি কিছু না বলতা sir please make detailed lecture what is this detailed lecture somebody says please make the detailed lecture what does it mean i i cannot uh, audio is clear sir audio is clear you are good sir please okay, okay. 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 anyway so next item i will discuss with them so let's go there i like to share it where are না আমি এবার ওয়েব এক্সটা কোথায় গেল আপনি <laughs> 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 Uh, students you said that is the please for the uh, detailed lecture detailed lecture i have given number of slides 60 slides uh, 60 lecture i have made you please go through those lecture and put up your question what is your question you please put up in the forum and very few question has come if you have i don't find any question very significant question has not come only numerical stuff this thing. basically this is not the thing numerical is not tough you have to put some level so you have to think about it apply your basic arithmetic basic algebra basic stoichiometry weight and material balance sales law equation stokes law whatever i teach in the class you have to apply those you have to put some level then only you will be able to solve the numerical nobody will teach you how to solve every problem one by one that is not this class for this is the class for giving you the concept of iron making and steel making and different numericals you solve it if you have any question put up in the forum never tell that it is stop or this and then we will be discussing okay somebody asked a question i think he did not understand actually you see in this course um you have transport phenomena and then uh, basic thermodynamics transport phenomena those are involved in this course i presume that you know the basic of those transport phenomena and all this thing if you not you have to go through the book little bit whenever i am discussing okay for example somebody asks that is the friction factor as a function that is the question was is reynolds number is also called velocity factor of pressure drop this is uh, this question is not very understandable i have not discussed anything about the velocity factor okay that is so maybe you want to mean the friction factor okay so is reynolds number is also called a friction factor no first of all you need to know what is called a reynolds number just since you take by just telling you reynolds number you know 
that is rho in this is the basic transport phenomena you need to know that rho in r by mu this is called the density rho u c is the characteristic velocity l c is the characteristic length and mu is the viscosity so any system if liquid is flowing through a tube or a liquid is flowing over a object or flowing through a conduit in that case you can calculate the reynolds number and uh, if you know what is the velocity and what is the characteristic velocity means there is a velocity that basically influence the transport of momentum okay that basically thing. and you can calculate also that velocity and you see is the length that basically influence the flow significantly that is called the characteristic length for example if a liquid is flowing through a tube a liquid is flowing through a tube okay then your uc uc is basically the free stream velocity that is the velocity with which it is called the free stream velocity before it enters the liquid that is called the free stream it is coming because free stream is called because liquid is not hindered by wall as soon as the liquid enters the tube its velocity is restricted by the wall because wall is the no slip boundary capacitor so as a result there upper slip a velocity profile is formed like this okay a parabolic velocity profile apnar ota dekhe dilo to onek bar babu hello so there will be a velocity profile apnar apnar ei je ta amar screen ta ke dekhe diyechilo sorry thik ache so this is the liquid will have a parabolic profile okay so this velocity which velocity will take and then also it is difficult also and that free stream velocity is sufficient because it will influence the velocity inside that is that that develop inside the tube okay so that's why you can take uc as the uh, uc as the uh, free stream velocity it is called the free stream velocity okay and then you'll see this is the lc you can take simply the diameter of the tube this is the diameter of the tube you can take the process so if you take that then it will be basically rho u infinity d by mu that is the for flow through a tube the reynolds number is defined like this and if you calculate a value it will give a number that is the dimensionless number because the dimension of rho u d and mu denominator and numerator are same and finally you will get a dimensionless number and it gives you an idea about the nature of the flow whether it is a turbulent flow or whether it is a your uh, what is that a laminar right so that is called a reynolds number and reynolds number is basically we so saw basically it's the ratio of the physical inertial force to the viscous force so that is the physical means and basically the using reynolds number you can say the transition of the flow from laminar flow to the turbulent flow again if i want to tell you what is turbulent flow laminar flow it should take a history and it will be a big class so think is that you have to learn something of your own or uh, you will have a class like this because it is not possible to discover it now think is that again when a liquid is flow through a tube then uh, you have a pressure drop okay at the end if you if your pressure is p1 if your pressure is p2 then your pressure drop will be given by what is this that is your p1 minus p2 okay because as the liquid flows through the tube it loses some of its pressure because of energy loss because of frictional force at the wall you lose a lot of energy liquid loses the energy so when the liquid reaches the other end then the p2 become much less compared to the p1 so as a result you have a pressure drop that is called the delta p now this pressure drop you can simply correlate that is uh, <coughs> that pressure drop is directly proportional to you can write it and what which factor this pressure drop uh varies it basically depends on the specific kinetic energy of the liquid obviously higher the kinetic energy your um so this is your specific kinetic energy you can say that is the square v not square okay where v not basically in this case you can take it simply infinity there is the free stream velocity okay directly proportional to the specific kinetic energy directly proportional to the surface area 
that is the twice pi r into l, l is the length like this, and then pressure drop, you can write it as, this is called the friction factor, and I define you in terms of psi, right? So, this is called, you can call it psi, and half into the square, into twice pi r. So this is the definition of friction factor in a, This is the definition of friction factor in a flow through a tube. If it is flowing through a tube, then you can define the friction factor like this. And again, it has an analytical solution. If you see the flow distribution, everything, it is a simple laminar flow. You have an analytical solution and you have an expression for the pressure drop by hagen the equation. Because psi, you can then calculate. This pressure drop, you can calculate analytically. And that analytical solution is given to calculate your uh, this pressure drop. Basically, the Q by volumetric flow rate is given by delta P by, if you say, that is the L into pi. Of, this is called hagen fossil equation. Okay. Um, that is your equation. So if you put this delta P here, and then you can get from where you can get, that is the psi is equal to around. 24 by R. You can do that thing. Okay. It will come like this. Psi is 24 by R. So that is the friction factor. Okay. That is the psi is oh, sorry, you cannot see there. That is the oh, this that psi is equal to okay. You can see here, like you can see this thing here. So for a laminar flow, flow through a smooth tube, your friction factor will be given by 24 by R. Because I know the analytical solution of pressure drop from here, that is called the hagen fossil equation. That is the PYAC. hagen fossil is equation, okay. So if you apply this pressure drop from the hagen fossil equation, you can get the psi. So for this is for a very simple system, psi is 24 by R for flow through a uh, smooth tube. So usually the friction factor is a function of Reynolds number. Basically, what is friction factor? Friction factor you gives you, you can see the pressure drop directly proportional to the specific kinetic energy, directly proportional to the surface area. And then what is the thing on which the moment of transfer decay that is the defense. Because when the liquid is flowing, that is the wall is constantly restrict the flow of the liquid. So energy loss is being taken place. And then that's why the pressure drop is taking place. And that pressure drop obviously depends on kinetic energy. And the higher the kinetic energy, higher will be the pressure drop. Higher is your surface area, higher will be the pressure drop. And also pressure drop depends on the fluid dynamic condition because the momentum transfer from the wall to the interior also depends on the pre dynamic condition in the momentum bound area. There is a momentum bound in that way. So it will also depends on the uh, your fluid dynamic condition. That fluid dynamic condition, because if your liquid is flowing at a very slow rate, then laminar flow, if it is flowing at a high rate, then it is the downwind flow. So mechanism of momentum transfer changes. So obviously your friction factor will be different. Okay. So so then, that is the things that's high. You see, the friction factor depends on the dynamic condition, and that will be a function of Reynolds number. Okay, Reynolds number basically characterizes what type of fluid flow you are getting, laminar, turbulent, or what. So you can get that. So that's why the psi is usually a function of Reynolds number, right? So in pack bed, what happens? The pack bed is similar to the uh, flow through a smooth tube also. Only in the pack bed, what you can find, you have. So these are the your granules and the fluid flows like this. Fluid flows through tortuous path like this, some path like this. These are the different paths through which the fluid moves. This is the fluid movement, okay? That is the fluid. Fluid path is this. These are the fluid paths. So fluid basically moves through very small, narrow tubes, narrow tortuous tubes through like this. And that, and basically what I said, in case of the flow through a smooth tube, 
it is the weighted surface area is only the surface area because it is weighting only the surface. But in this case, the fluid is moving through the interior of the particles. So weighted surface area here, that is very important. That is the how much fluid is, is weighting the surface. So that surface area is very important. So for that, uh, your uh, friction factor, friction factor, uh, will be function of Reynolds number here actually the I'm writing psi is a function of Reynolds number obviously Reynolds number and you if you define the pressure drop here also pressure drop by delta p by h h is the height will be directly proportional to as I said and this will be your psi into as I said that uh, if you remember that thing the pressure drop equation is the right psi into one minus epsilon by what is that epsilon q into d of the particle, okay, into rho into v naught square, right, into t by t naught and v naught by p. This is the way I have written that. You can see this thing, this is very important. In case of the smooth tube, uh, this is simply your four by d. In case of the smooth tube, it was the diameter of the tube only. Here you can find, the weighted surface area depends on the voidage, that is the size, size the voidage. And dp is the particle diameter. So particle diameter and the voidage basically dictates how much will be your weighted surface area. So it is not the diameter, not the diameter of the tube that is important, it is the diameter of the particle and uh, voidage that is voidage is simply that is the volume fraction of gas uh, in the pit that is called the voidage. What is the fraction of volume of the gas into the pan bed that is called the voidage. Somebody asks also voidage. Okay, so then this is your friction factor in case of the pack bed. In case of the pack bed, weighted surface area will be given like this and then this is the specific kinetic energy and this is the temperature and pressure correction inside the glass furnace. And you can, uh, and this psi is a function of Reynolds number. This is also a function of modified Reynolds number, I say, because where Reynolds number I define a little differently, that is V by mu into one minus epsilon. This is the way I define. Okay, that is called the modified Reynolds number. Okay, that's fine. And then, so, so for back bit, this correlation I have given already to you. And you can know that it's the rho v, and this is the temperature pressure correction. And rho v naught, I have written it as in the uh, rho v naught square. You can write it as rho v naught into v naught, where basically rho v naught is g naught. There's a mass flow rate into velocity. So you can see only temperature pressure correction for velocity because mass flow rate doesn't depend on the temperature and pressure. So it is the v naught only depends on the temperature pressure. So this correction is sufficient. So these are the things is there actually. Okay, so this is the way I have written. <clears throat> so I can now uh, share it. Stop sharing. I think this lecture should be more interactive. Your question I should hear and then I will answer your question. And it is better. Okay. Uh, then what are the other questions? Let's see. Was there, uh, Okay, uh, what is the effect of misbet beyond 4% particle size? It is not, actually you are mistaken. That is the 4% particle size, no? that is the, I say it, that is the when the particle size is very small, um, then your flow resistance increasing exponentially, right? Suddenly it increases. Even the heat and mass transfer resistance also increases exponentially. Uh, when the particle size becomes less than three and four meters. This is laboratory scale experiment which we have seen. But when the particle size is beyond five millimeter, so greater than five millimeter, then the flow resistance and heat and mass transfer is not affected by the particle diameter so significantly. A minor uh, dependence is there, but it is small. So that I wanted to tell you. You see the figure. If you see the figure, you will understand that. Thing. Okay? Okay. Then, uh, where is the Oh, is, is my skin still shared? 
You don't see this year now. I've come out of the shell, right? No, sir. No, sir. Achha. No, sir. So YouTube, you can see me. Okay, okay, fine. So now, next is uh, question was, um, now what is the voltage? Voltage, as I said, it is the volume fraction of gas inside the pack bed that is called the voltage. Shear root constant. It is not a shear root constant. Uh, Basically, it is a shear root number. Shear root number is called the dimensionless mass transfer coefficient. Again, you need to know some basic concept about the okay, uh, <coughs> mass transfer coefficient. Uh, okay, thing is that what is called the mass transfer coefficient? Um, Suppose you have a heterogeneous interface, a solid is dissolving into a liquid, a solid is dissolving into a liquid, then what happens? Uh, there is a the concentration boundary there, right? This is the thing because the concentration varies like this. This is the concentration profile. Okay. And this is called the concentration boundary there. Anyway, you don't prepare that thing because what is this? Because the concentration beyond that, there is no gradient. Here only gradient is there. Concentration gradient is here only. Okay. You, you can find the maximum concentration gradient is here only. Okay. 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 Can you see my cursor here? Okay. okay. Now I can see. Yeah. Here the concentration gradient exists only into the boundary layer. Beyond that, there is no concentration gradient. That's why it is called the boundary layer. So there existed resistance to mass transfer flow. Okay, there existed resistance to mass transfer. Okay. And then if I tell you what is the from here to here at heterogeneous interface, what is the flux? If you have a uh, what is the mass flux? What is the from here? What is the mass flux? Mass flux at heterogeneous interface. So mass flux at the heterogeneous interface, basically if you have a solid and then fluid, and then you want to calculate the mass flux. There are very analytical approach, but those are very difficult. You have to have the concentration profile and then you can calculate. It's a very difficult thing actually, if you want to solve the heat mass point and transfer in the concentration boundary there is a very complicated thing and people as also also very is there some solution, but that I'm not going to that. But most of the engineers basically apply uh, the flux. That is, the flux is defined as uh, flux obviously is directly proportional to the concentration difference. That is, the, if you say that is the concentration is uh, C surface and this is your C bulk. Okay, so delta C is basically C bulk minus C surface. That is the concentration difference. And the flux is equal to came into delta C and this proportionality constant is called the mass transfer coefficient. Okay. Mass transfer coefficient. This is called the mass transfer coefficient. And this mass transfer coefficient is a you can understand it is a very empirical phenomena, empirical parameter. And it basically also depends on the fluid dynamic condition inside the concentration. There is a concentration boundary layer. Okay. And anyway, this is its physical significance. But uh, in the literature, you will find a lot of correlations are there for mass transfer coefficient. Okay, so you can calculate the mass transfer coefficient for different system for flow over a tube, flow through a conduit, or flow over an object. So for every situation, you have different correlation, and these correlations are given in terms of dimensionless number such that they become universal. You can apply it, right? And so that correlation, dimensionless correlation is called the dimensionless correlation. So you can write it as shear root number as a function of Reynolds number and Smith number. Okay, these are the dimensionless number. This is called the shear root number. And shear root number is basically given as your Km 
that is the one, yeah, yeah, ML by D. That is the diffusivity, this is the mass diffusivity. And so it basically gives you a ratio of convective mass transfer to the diffusive mass transfer. Okay. Anyway, this is a dimensionless mass transfer also. You can say, you can call it a serial number or dimensionless mass transfer coefficient. And this is as a function of Reynolds number and Smith number. Reynolds number I have defined and Smith number is also, uh, it is basically, you know, in this case, is equal to mu by, uh, mu by D. Okay. Mu is the kinematic viscosity, D is the diffusivity. So this is called the Smith number. So these correlations are there. So it is not a serial constant. Basically, serial number is nothing but dimensionless mass transfer position. And from this correlation, you can calculate uh, the mass transfer position. A very well-known correlation for a sphere. Suppose a fluid is moving over a sphere, right? A fluid moving over a sphere, then correlation is called the serial number is 2 plus 0.6 re to the power. One third, one second, and c to the power one third, and it is called the range marshall correlation. So this is called the range marshall correlation, and it is available in literature. So several other literature is there. So if you want to calculate the mass transfer position over a fluid, over a sphere, so when you have a sphere and fluid is moving over it then you can simply take this correlation to calculate the mass transfer position. From here, you can get Km, and then you can apply the Km to calculate the flux at the heterogeneous interface. And if you know the flux, so you can calculate everything, how much time it will require for dissolving a fluid, for dissolving a solid into fluid like that. You can easily calculate. For leaching experiment, you can calculate how much time it will take for complete dissolution of solid particles in the fluid. So similarly, the, I have used the concept of mass transfer coefficient into the, I think, gas uh, that is the in the film layer. No? That is the film layer. That is when your solid uh, is basically uh, reacting. That is the your FU and then the your, uh, uh, what this, no? FU plus CO is equal to FU plus CO, CO2. So for that, the carbon monoxide, that is the CO is coming from this, and then it is the reaction is taking place, and then you are forming the iron. So in the film, so if it is a film is there, suppose you have a gas film like this, that is the gas film. So in this case, the mass transfer coefficient, you can calculate from the reversal coefficient. Gas film mass transfer coefficient. You can from the coefficient. So you understand that. Okay, so this is, the basic transport related to this. Okay. Then uh, our time period. Okay. Some other questions were there. That is the normal should transport as well. Adiabatic temperature, basically, we know I think we have explained also what is called the adiabatic temperature, flame temperature. Basically, you consider that is the whatever the heat, sensible heat is coming in by the air. And whatever the heat is generated by carbon oxidation, okay, this is the total heat generation by carbon oxidation plus heat is sensible heat coming through the air blast in the blast furnace. This is the total heat input, okay, and that should be equal to uh, that is completely used up to heat up the two air gas to the adiabatic temperature, and we are not considering any heat loss, okay. So in the race way, we are considering as an adiabatic, adiabatic reactor, such that from the race way, no heat is going up. So thing is that, so whatever the heat is coming by the air plus, sensible heat plus heat of reaction, that is give rise to the air temperature, flame temperature. After that, flame is moving and then it is dissipating. So that's why you call it adiabatic flame temperature, as if the race way as an adiabatic reactor, where basically you are inlating the air blast with some sensible heat, you are making some um, carbon oxidation, so heat is getting generated, and there is the two heat input, and that will be equal to the sensible heat that will be reflected in terms of sensible heat on the two air gas. Uh, and no heat, there's all the heat input is equal to uh, heat output in the form of sensible heat of the two air gas. No other heat is leaking the uh, boundary of the disk. 
Okay, that is for you. Fine. Then. Somebody said the fast assignment is self demotivating. I don't understand why it is staying. Possibly he is getting this difficult. It is not difficult at all. You apply the, apply the basic uh, your, uh, mathematics. And try to solve this problem. If you demotivate it so, so quickly, then you will be demotivated all the time. It is not the question of demotivation. You try to solve it. You get the solution. Okay, assignment. Uh, assignment. Assessment. Every. Somebody asked what is sponge iron. I think we will get there. I think that if people are from industry. Sponge iron is simply, if you uh, let me tell you that later on you will get a uh, lot of scope to understand the sponge iron. Sponge iron is the product of solid state reduction of iron. Basically, in the blast furnace, we see the iron in the form of a liquid bottle, right? Because you go to very high temperature where the iron is liquid. But you can produce also iron in the solid state. Okay, and the idea is because basically, as I said, in the blast furnace, you have you have to operate the blast furnace to a uh, <coughs> strong raw material or better raw material like coal. That is, the coal cannot be directly used into the blast furnace because it is very fragile. Uh, during its descent through the blast furnace, it will generate a lot of dust and it will hinder the gas passage, you can increase the resistance for the flow through the bed. As a result, a lot of uh, problems will come like channeling, handling, all this problem. And also blast furnace will not work. Everything get fluidized also and then come out uh, from the bulk of the blast furnace. So everything is fine. So you cannot tolerate, the blast furnace cannot tolerate the fines too much. Okay? So think is that because it simply decreases the permeability, amplify the permeability. So the thing is, so blast furnace operate with a very good raw material because coal, poking coal in the air and the poking coal has to be converted to a very solid mass called the coke. Similarly, uh, your direct runoff mine loads only nowadays very only 10% of the charge constitute the direct runoff mine loads. That is the form of ores, direct lumpy woods you cannot charge in the blast furnace because lumpy wood is also fragile they also break under compression and pressure and abrasion of this thing so you can use very small amount of one of my modes and uh, <coughs> you have to center it basically the undersized wood and then also some wood you can crush it and then you can center it or you can pelletize it if you have very fines available Okay, you can pelletize and then you can charge in the blast furnace. To see that and pellets are the better charge in the blast furnace because of the stain, the reactivity. So, blast furnace is a very good reactor, as I say, it is a fantastic reactor till today because it is a heat and mass exchanges. And also, I have showed you thermodynamic can you also, it efficiency can go up to 85%. That is the CO utilization efficiency can go maximum up to 85%. So those are the things that are there, and but blast furnace requires some stringent material. Somebody also asked what is called the stringent. Stringent is basically it requires a very good quality of the body, which has a good strength and reactivity, right? So in the blast furnace, you cannot use the non-poking coal because non-poking coal cannot be converted to the coke also. Okay. So besides this coke making, coke oven and the center plants also pollutes the atmosphere. Right, so people are trying to use the non coping coal and without using this instrument like coke oven and center that follows the atmosphere. So, if you want to use the direct non coping coal or if you want to use the gas or the synthetic gas to reduce the iron load and produce a solid iron in the solid state, that is called the spot. So, you can use non coping coal or you can use the synthetic gas to reduce the iron load in the solid state. And below 900 degree, around 1000 degree, because if you reduce by carbon, then you prepare around 1000 degree centigrade because it is reduction is done by in situ CO generation. Otherwise, if you use the gas, uh, synthetic gas, you can reduce it uh, simply. Synthetic or the reform gas, if you use, you can reduce it by 700 to 800 degree centigrade also. And the product is uh, 
solid iron, and that is called the sponge iron. Why it is called the sponge iron? Because it is not a sponge like soft. It is not like that, but it is very hard. But if you see under the microscope, you can find a lot of pores into it because when the gas has come out, it generates a lot of pores inside it, so it is very spongy. Okay, that's why it is called sponge iron, and its composition is uh, only carbon. Well, it, it depends on the gas based or the cold based process. If it is a cold based process, the carbon can be of the order of 0.15 weight percent of carbon will be there. In case of the gas based, you can increase up to 2 percent and even more today because sometimes you can give more carbon into the by, by modifying the operating parameters. That is different. Anyway, and in 1 to 2 percent, you can say there's the carbon in the gas based DRI. In case of cold based DRI, it is very low, 0.15%, because in the solid state, it is very difficult for carbon to diffuse into the iron, unlike into the liquid state in hot metal. Hot metal, you see the carbon percentage is around 3 to 4%, 8 to, I mean 4 to 5%, almost to the saturation level, because in the liquid state, carbon can easily diffuse, quickly diffuse. In the solid state, it cannot diffuse. That's why the DRI is very pure, especially the cold based uh, one. That is, is a very pure in this sense, and uh, only carbon percentage will be 0.15%. It may have some sulfur, but if you use the flux, uh, sulfur is also very less. So it's almost pure iron. Only 0.15 to 0.2% carbon is there in case of the cold iron. Okay, so this is the composition. So you can get to that as you go into it because my feet are. Uh, later lectures are there, alternative groups of iron making. There, I have discussed all this thing. So, so something will come. Anyway, you can post this question. You can you can ask this question in the forum. This type of question will definitely answer it. I will request Binoy to answer all the questions. If Binoy cannot do, he will take my intervention. If he can take me, I can answer directly. I will also try to answer your question. You just put up the question on the forum as and then it's written. Go on putting this question. Okay, I'll answer it. Okay. Then, uh, and the, another question was then how to get the optimum partitioning of bustite oxygen between direct and indirect production. I've given a, a complete lecture. You can see uh, there you can find out uh, this thing. But uh, if you want, uh, is there any time, solution time? Because you just go through the lecture once and again, I think it will be clear to you. Okay, how the partitioning is done. If you have any specific question, then if you ask, then it is better to answer that question. Uh, if you ask, that is the how the partitioning, then it is difficult. Anyway, I let me tell you why the partitioning of uh, in the blast furnace is a very counter kind gas solid lecture. It's a very interesting thing. Uh, let me answer. This is the last question, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't think any more question is there after that. So, adivity flame temperature tool we have discussed already. Uh, then, let's, uh, <coughs> we have some time, 10, 15 minutes, 10 minutes time is there. Let us share my, uh, and, and let us discuss this thing. How many students are there now? Can you see? Just a minute, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, concurrent, concurrent user is nine, sir. Only? Only. So viewer, there are view, uh, viewer, uh, more than 96, 96 viewer, but concurrent users are nine. Oh, few are ninety are there. Okay, fine. Okay. Then it is. Then it is okay. Fine. fine. So now, then, then, then it is what discussing this idea. Okay. So we'll discuss this thing. That is the partitioning of uh, direct and indirect reduction of the lustite uh, oxygen. This is very important. Just ten minutes. So we'll discuss it. Uh, So if you see the blast furnace, uh, then blast furnace, if you see it, it's 
So the from here the gas moves up CO gas. You can find here basically the FU is reduced to the AT. And then in the upper part here, it is basically AP304 to the ATO. And here, AP203. Oh, yeah. You want you can see my screen completely, no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, three. Three, three, four, four. so this is happening basically and the CO. So when the CO comes, it first encountered the AFU. Okay. So already Fe2O3 has reduced to Fe3O4, Fe3O4 has been reduced to FeO. When it when the charge comes near the bottom, there only FeO is there, Ustite is there. So Ustite first encountered the CO, fresh CO, and then Ustite get reduced to iron, both by direct reduction and as well as by indirect reduction. As I'll show you, if I partition the oxygen of Ustite by direct and indirect reduction, I can increase the efficiency of the furnace significantly, right? So that is the thing. Let us see how much oxygen is there. So if you see per ton of iron, Fe2O3, Fe2O3 contained around how much? That is your 429 kg of oxygen per ton of iron. This much of oxygen is associated with the Fe2O3. Simple stoichiometry you do will get. Similarly, Fe3O4, and this contains around your 381, so 381 kg of oxygen. And then when you come to the Ustite, FeO 1.06 because it is non stoichiometric so I will write it as 1.06, okay? 1.06 FeO, that is around 302 kg. So when you are coming from Fe2 through Fe3 O4, you are leaving, the oxygen reduced is around 48 kg. And when you are coming from Fe3 O4 to FeO, oxygen reduced around you know, 79 kg or 80 kg. And then, if you to Fe, that is the 302 kg, that is the maximum oxygen is associated with the Ustite. You can find that is the large amount of oxygen is associated with the Ustite, right? So 302 kg. And then I can partition this much of kg of oxygen between direct and indirect reduction. Then the efficiency increases significantly. Now we know the direct indirect reduction I have already discussed. Indirect reduction is that when your uh, reduction is taking place by the CO gas, okay? And that is generated in the lower part of the parts, okay? And direct reduction is that, that is when your FeO is reacting with the carbon forming the Fe. That means actually solid solid reaction doesn't take place for a long time. You see, basically, uh, the direct reduction, what I call it, that is the FeO plus C is equal to Fe plus CO, okay? So this is, I called a direct reduction. This is basically a combination of the two reaction. That is, you can say FeO plus CO or being Fe plus CO2. You know that thing, CO2 plus C or being twice CO. Okay, so this CO is coming here and this CO goes here. Okay, so these two reaction basically gives you this direct reaction. That means basically this reaction has to happen for the direct reduction. For direct reduction, uh, your, that is the CO2 plus C forming twice CO, this reaction has to happen. And it happens only at high temperature. That's why direct reduction is possible only at high temperature because the carbon reduces FeO by in situ generation of CO by carbon gasification reaction. That's why it's called direct reduction. So direct reduction does not depend on external CO supply. But in the upper part of the furnace, it is the CO generated uh, upper part of the farm is what happens in the upper part. When the CO generated in the lower part or by the direct reduction, whatever the CO is generating here, that CO basically reduces the Fe3O4 and Fe2O3. And the carbon directly do not participate in the upper part of the furnace. That's why that is called the indirect reduction, right? Now, if you see, uh, <coughs> 
let us partition that thing. That is the thing. That is the when the CO is coming out. You you know that indirect reduction of ratio is very uh, carbon consuming. That is the indirect reduction. If I see idea. Uh, Indirect reduction of this type, idea of a few, idea of this type, let us see. This is, you know, that a few plus 3.3 CO, if you get the question, if I write, it is not the stoichiometry. At the, the equilibrium, the stoichiometry is like this. So, Fe plus 2.3 CO plus CO2, you know. So, this is the reaction because uh, the equilibrium requirement is very high. Around 30%, uh, around 70% CO remains in equilibrium with the Fe. Fe. Only 30% reacts. So, its utilization is only 30%. That's why 3 by 3.3 three moles is required for to remove one gram atom of oxygen from the oostide, it requires 3.3 moles of CO because equilibrium requirement is very high. 2.3 moles of CO will remain in equilibrium in the CO2 and only one mole of CO will react to this. This is the equilibrium. This is the other. And direct reduction, direct reduction of oostide you can write. This is the reaction. Okay, so you can see it is very economic in carbon. Direct reduction is very much economic in carbon, where indirect reduction is very expensive in carbon. That is very important. So if we can adjust these two, that is, you can partition the oxide oxygen using direct and indirect. I can uh, save the carbon significantly. Okay, so that was the idea. So let's say XKG, XKG of oxide carbon. Is removed by is removed directly is removed by direct reduction, right? So three hundred and two minus six kg by indirect reduction, indirect reduction. Okay, or you can say x by twelve uh, is by sixteen. It's not carbon, sorry, oxygen, oxygen. Here it is. Oxygen. And uh, so this much, so you can say this much, this kg mole of this, this is the kg mole, with, then it becomes kg mole. So this much kg mole of oxygen, which type oxygen is removed by DR, and this much kg mole is by indirect production. So how much CO generation by direct production? CO generation. by dr so direct reduction from co generation from this reaction a lot of co is generated basically you can see one kg mole of one kg atom of oxygen will produce one kg mole of co so you this much of kg 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 atom it will be kg atom kg atom of this type oxygen is in so so co generation by dr is equal to x by 16 kg mole because one kg atom of oxygen, if you want to do one kg atom of oxygen, you produce one kg mole of CO. So if you want to do X by 16 kg atom of oxygen, you will produce X by 16 kg mole of CO. So this is the CO generation. And if you want to remove this much of oxygen, uh, kg atom you write for this. When you divide by 16, it is better to tell that much of kg atom of oxygen. Not the more you write this. Okay. This much of kg atom of oxygen, if you want to remove by indirect reduction, one kg atom of oxygen, if you want to remove, you get three point three. So, if you want to remove this much of kg atom of oxygen for more or for most time, you require that is the CO required for IDR or this type.
So that will be basically 302 minus 6 by 16. 3.3 into that thing. So this thing. So if you equate these two, that means x by 16 is equal to 3.3 uh, into 302 minus 6 by 16. If you do that, your x will come around 230. Yeah, it will come around um, 230. So what happens is that whatever the CO generated by, because you are generating some CO by direct reduction, if you use the same amount of CO to reduce the rest of the oustite oxygen by indirect reduction, if you can do that, then it will be the maximum efficiency. Okay, so you are generating the CO and you are generating, you know, you are that basically uh, satisfies the rest of the indirect reduction for oustite. So that's why there's the CO generated by uh, direct reduction just to can look at the CO required to remove the rest of the oxide oxygen by indirect reduction. So then it is 230 kg, and that is basically it is basically 429 by 230, 54% of the total oxidable oxygen. So if you remove the 54% of the oxide oxygen by direct reduction, you get the maximum carbon efficiency. And you, 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 you can simply uh, calculate what is the your uh, <coughs> now CO two produced how much will be the CO two produced CO two produced by the uh, produced how much basically your two thirty three four twenty nine right minus of two thirty two. This was only by direct reduction. And rest of this oxygen, this is the total oxygen associated with the boostite and then your uh, magnetite and hematite. This much of oxygen is there divided by 16. So this much of kg mole of oxygen will be, uh, kg atom of oxygen will be removed indirectly. So indirect reduction, you can write simply like this. So basically what you are doing, so one kg atom, atom will produce one kg mole of CO2. So this much of kg atom will produce this much of kg mole of CO2. So this much kg mole is around, this is if you calculate, it will be, um, this thing is how much? 12.31 kg mole, okay, 3.1 kg mole. So this is the total CO2 produced. So initially you have CO, and then in the exit cast you have divided into the CO and CO2. CO2, here it was how much? There's a total uh, carbon repair because direct reduction, how much CO you generated? That is the... That is 14.5 kg, I think, yeah. 14.5 was there. That is the this much of kg mole of CO2 was there, kg mole of C was there by direct reduction. And then out of which 12.31 uh, kg mole of CO2 you are generating. So your ETA efficiency, ETA CO is basically total 14.5 out of which you have converted to 12.31200. That is your TT. 85%. This is around 85%. So you see the ETA efficiency is very high. And carbon requirement, if you calculate the carbon requirement, this is the lowest and only 14.5. This has been generated by direct reduction. So carbon consumed will be simply this much of kg mole of carbon, kg atom of carbon. So this is basically 14.5 uh, into 12, that is your 174 kg. That is the 174, right? So this is the minimum carbon required in a, uh, in a blast furnace. Actually, you know, this is the carbon requirement if you have 54% direct reduction of oxide and uh, list of the indirect reduction. <laughs> if you remove 54% of the total oxygen by directly, and 46% oxygen indirectly, then the blast furnace efficiency is 85%. Uh, 
there is the eta su, there is the, uh, the su equalization is very high. And it is happening because the gas is counter current. Because after reducing the boost time, it is taking up the rest of the oxygen from the higher oxygen. Okay. And uh, so this is the carbon decarbonate is the minimum. Because in, uh, I have shown you the graph you can see there is a carbon decarbonate goes like this. So this is your 46%. And so indirect reduction will increase the percentage indirect reduction doing this and the carbon decarbonate carbon is this carbon in kg. Okay, so this is the 174 kg. Um, this is 100% direct reduction also a little higher and 100% indirect reduction also very high. And uh, say 100% idea. And this is 100% dr. And this is the optimum, 46%, 46% idea <laughs> the minimum carbon decarbonate is here and maximum efficiency of getting this here so this is the idea so once the carbon rate is only 174 kg so of course it doesn't consider the heat requirement and all this thing okay so that was there and then one question people can ask that is the whatever now uh, you require the CO requirement for the, if you want to remove the oxygen from the higher oxide, what is the total CO requirement if you want to see? Uh, because uh, after, uh, after you see, after the indirect reduction, after, uh, after the indirect reduction of oustite, so how much oxygen is left out? How much? CO is left out. It is simply 14.5 was total. There is the CO devolved by direct reduction and it's 30% only will be utilized for indirect reduction and 70% will move out. So 70% uh, A will be left out. So this 14.5 into 75 is coming around to around how much it is. It is around to um, Ten point one five. If you see, it will come ten point one five kg more. And how much? How much? Uh, the CO requirement for indirect reduction idea of the three CO four and if you do it. So this will be simply for Fe three O four. How much you know? Seventy nine kg of oxygen you have to use from Fe three O four. Okay, by sixteen, this much of kg atom of oxygen you have to remove. And Fe three O four reduction, you know that utilization is eighty percent. So your carbon requirement will be one point two five. Utilization is eighty percent. Twenty percent is there, and then you will then do. And for and this is forty eight kg of Fe two O three. And it, uh, 48 kg of uh, Fe2O3 and Fe2O3 oxygen. And so this much kg atom of oxygen that has to be removed from Fe2O3. And Fe2O3, we have seen that it is almost irreversible. It doesn't have any equilibrium requirement. So this thing, so if you see, it will come around 9.17. So uh, this much of CO requirement is there. And for after indirect reduction, your this much of CO is moving up. That means what I'm telling that is from the blast furnace, you know, um, I did it here somewhere here. You can see this part here. So, so when the gas is coming out, so you feel, and then maybe three or four, maybe three or three. So after all reduction, you have 10.15, yeah. 10.15 CO is moving up. And this requirement is here. Yeah, yeah, requirement is your 9.17. This is the requirement that it is moving up 10.15. So this 10.15 kg of CO will definitely take out the 
uh, oxygen from this hydroxide, no problem. So at maximum efficiency also, whatever the CO left out after indirect reduction of AFU is more than sufficient to reduce completely this epithelial core and epithelial. Okay. So that is not a problem. Okay. So this is the thing, this is very important concept. So at least the thermodynamically we can show that is the uh, maximum efficiency in the blast furnace can be obtained like this. Since it is a counter current process, so then it is possible. But anyway, you can see after maximum efficiency also around 50% CO has to leave the blast furnace. You cannot uh, reduce the CO beyond that point. So in the blast furnace, at least 15% of uh, CO, in the CO-CO2 mixture, don't mix up with the uh, CO-CO2 and nitrogen. Then it does, then the, then the nitrogen will be there, the case will be different. Okay. In CO-CO2 mixture, at least 15% CO will leave. And uh, <clears throat> okay. So if your nitrogen is there, the percentage of CO in the exit gas should be much much less. Okay. But anyway, but in a real system, in real last point is you don't find so much of efficiency because it is not possible to maintain this. 54% uh, of direct reduction in this is meter. In fact, the direct reduction is not a problem. The blast furnace direct reduction will take place because the lower part of the furnace at a high temperature. So direct reduction always takes place. It is basically take place in more extent, more than 60%. And it is very difficult to maintain the more than for that is the 46% indirect reduction because it required a very good permeability. Because the gas residual time is very less. At the same time, if your permeability is not very good, then indirect reduction, achieving 46% indirect reduction is not very easy task. So that's why the blast fund is burning material also has to be good, such that you can promote the indirect reduction. There are different methods of promoting the indirect reduction. This is one thing is the bed permeability. Another thing is that uh, interaction of the uh, hydrogen bearer through the pure gas injection. If you give a lot of hydrogen there, because hydrogen is a better reductant than CO gas, both thermodynamically and kinetically. So that also improves the indirect reduction. So improving, promoting the indirect reduction in the blast furnace is the most important job. Direct reduction eventually takes place. But how to increase the indirect reduction, that is the permeability and the hydrogen bearer, and all these things you have to think about. Then you can achieve, if you achieve this maximum efficiency, 85% CO, CO utilization, that is the maximum efficiency in blast furnace someone can achieve, right? Okay, so if you take care of all kinetics parameter as well as, uh, that is the kinetics parameter you have to take into account. This is the thermodynamics I'm talking about. That is the 85% is possible thermodynamically, but there is a lot of kinetic limitation. You have to, that's the permeability, all this coming into picture when you consider the kinetics, okay. So that's why your term is called the SAP deficiency. SAP deficiency is basically dictates, that is the how much you are closer to the equilibrium value. So 85% is the equilibrium value, how much you can come closer to that. So that is, the, that deviation is called the, uh, the SAP deficiency, 90% people say 90% is the That is your C utilization from 0.9 or 0.8. Okay, so that much. That is also very good to ask us. But 100% is very difficult. Okay, thank you very much for today's lecture. Uh, let us uh, leave session. Okay, this is not lecture. For lecture, you must go through my uh, that is the lecture. That is the 60 lecture difficulty. And if you have any question, I'm still feeling there is a you just put up specific question, very specific question in the forum. I must answer it. My student, I am there always to answer your question. So, okay. So, don't hesitate to put up the question in the forum. You just keep on posting the question, you must answer it. And deep session will be there, other two deep sessions will be there. So, you can participate also in this deep session. But, uh, but I will encourage you to put up the question in the forum. Okay. And you must answer. Thank you very much. Okay, we come to end up. Just wait, sir, 30 uh, seconds. Okay. Okay.